Hello, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. He is part of our community, and he has his own podcast on our site, and it's Sander Van Stee, and he is the owner of Moral Eats, and today he'd like to talk about animal welfare, and I'm very excited about to hear this topic. Um, he has uh, a few uh, pointers that he wants to, to stress. And so I'm very excited to get onto this, this topic. Sander, can you tell us a little about your thoughts on animal welfare? Absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to answer a couple of key questions that are kind of foundational to any topic around animal welfare. And one of them is, should we be eating animals in the first place? From the animal's perspective. And then, yeah, and then beyond that, I've also had people ask me since the mission of Moral Eats is to improve animal welfare. I've had people ask me, why not turn Moral Eats into an animal sanctuary? So I'd like to address that question as mm -hmm. well. We'll see where we end up from there. <laughs> but question number one is, should we be eating animals? Is it in the best interest of the animal? And we have to kind of take a lesson from the Lion King and look at the circle of life and realize that in a circle in general, there's no beginning or end. It just keeps going around and around and around. So what happens when we, when we say that we no longer want animals or prey animals to die, if we don't want to eat prey, prey animals, because we think it's in their best interests. Well, because it's a circle, if there's no end, there's also no beginning. Right. So you, you're basically saying that you don't think these animals have a life that's worth living. You're basically saying that these prey animals shouldn't exist because they're suffering too much. There's too much suffering in their existence and that it's not worth living. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Every, any life involves some suffering. There's no joy without suffering. There's no happiness without sadness. You can't have one extreme without the other. But you can't say that there's nothing but suffering in the life of a prey animal because their average day does not involve being hunted or being chased or being abused by a farmer. Their average day is basically them socializing with their herd mates or exploring their environment, eating. They get hungry, so they eat. They get thirsty, so they drink. And that's their average day today. There's lots of small positive interactions and, and positive experiences throughout that. And then when done properly, at the end of the life, they have one bad day. And some amount of suffering is unavoidable, but you can even, in the case of agriculture, you can even manage their last moments to be as little stress as possible, basically humane slaughter. In the wild, that's not necessarily the case. Unfortunately, in the wild, there's usually a tremendous amount of suffering involved in the last mm -hmm. moment. But even then, it doesn't outweigh a lifetime of positive experiences. Right. So, but if we grant them that 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 these prey animals shouldn't die, or or if we go down that road rather, and we say if if no prey animals die and no prey animals live, basically there's no existence, then there's also no predator predators anymore. There's because there's no animals for the predators to eat. Right. So like if the prey animals don't have a life worth living and we end their existence, well, then we're also in extension ending the existence of any predators. Right. So basically we're collapse that entire food chain to the point where it is comp uh, absolutely fragile and and not sustainable because you need that that diversity in that food chain for it to exist. Right. So if if the food chain exists, the ecosystem will collapse as well right. so because you don't have a healthy food chain you don't have a healthy ecosystem and basically what we're left with is a very unhealthy ecosystem and because a lot of these animals are critical for cycling nutrients and stuff like that and improving the environment but you, all we're really left with is humans and some non-sentient creatures like sponges and stuff like that like that is not a very positive happy world to live in so yeah. like there's something that um freud the psychologist termed as the devouring mother and that is basically a mother that is so overbearing and so protective that their young can't flourish and learn 
and develop properly. And right. then you end up with, uh, because that the young, the kids don't develop properly, they're because they stay dependent on their parents and they never thrive as a functional human being to the point where they're able to, to help society or contribute to society. So like, and that, so like, this whole argument around, I'm going to try to improve animal welfare by, by not eating animals is along the same lines of reasoning as the devouring mother. Basically you're compassionate to a fault yeah. because living in this idealistic world that doesn't reflect reality. That's not how the world works. You're not actually doing anything in the best interest of the animal because it's not in the animal's best interest to not exist. Yeah. If you really want to help the animals, you're best off trying to improve their lives, give mm -hmm. them as many, like try to manage their or or affect their life so that they have the most possible positive experiences with the least amount of negative experiences. Right. That's how you truly improve their lives, not by eliminating their species. Yes. So that's question one. Then question two is uh, we have a, a farm and we have a decent amount of acreage for Ontario um, and a decent sized farm. What if instead of contributing to the food system and trying to improve animal welfare and have that effect on agriculture as a whole, what if we just instead changed all, all, our, all of our, our farm over to an animal sanctuary and just kept the animals that we have now and just let them live out their life and and then ask for donations and things like that right what would be the, the result as from a welfare perspective to to these animals and it sounds promising because the animals that will be in our sanctuary would have an amazing life they would have a very long life not perfect i don't think it's the perfect scenario for animal welfare because the perfect ex um scenario for animal welfare from a prey animal's perspective is you have a massive continent full of food and no predators and your species can just explode in population basically to infinity until and like basically there's no there's no end there's no borders there's no water around it it just you just have expansion and food to infinity yeah can happen ultimately if there's no predators the population will explode to the point where the food decreases and then they'll either go hungry or disease will spread and yeah. there'll be a tremendous amount of suffering until that population is kept in check in one way, form or another. Right. So an animal sanctuary, um, the problem with animal sanctuaries is that some of those ex um, behaviors that the animals would like to express these prey animals, they can't in, in, in the situation of being in a sanctuary, they can't reproduce right. and reproduce is one of the main drives of any living thing and you, they they don't and you don't these animals don't get afforded that ability to reproduce in, in the case of a sanctuary so it's not a perfect system but say we did that right and so they they we did have a sanctuary and they lived this long life they had lots of positive experiences then unfortunately there's a relatively small number of animals that we could affect in this mm -hmm. way on our farm there's only several hundred animals that we'd be say, okay, these these are these animals have an amazing life, and that's basically it. All the rest of the animals are going to continue on living the way they do, and and because the scale is so much smaller, the positive impact is limited. Yeah. And if even if all farms were to stop producing animal products and all became animal sanctuaries, there's a very, very limited number of, of sanctuaries that can be supported purely on donations. Right. So if you want all farms of the, of that produce animal products to become animal sanctuaries, most of those would, would, would suffer to the point that like those animals in those sanctuaries would suffer because there's no financial means to support them. Yeah. And eventually the point where there's a relatively small number of animal sanctuaries and next to no prey animals, no, next to no farm animals anymore and essentially that species will cease to exist which once again is not in the animal's best interest right well with moral eats 
it's it's um it works really well where it's self-sustaining if you truly want um a solution to animal suffering or basically any problem if you truly want a solution that's sustainable it needs to be a profitable solution it needs right. to both sustain itself and not be dependent on donations and goodwill because like what happens when you have an economic downturn and people are no longer able to support your 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 charity or whatever like yeah. it's not a very sustainable solution whereas a profitable solution is a sustainable solution it sustains itself so right. that's what more eats does it profitably improves the lives of farm animals but it's not limited in scale unlike an animal sanctuary would be we can continue improving or having that positive impact on all of our farm animals throughout the life cycle of, and going from one generation to another, there's almost an unlimited number of animals that we could impact. So right. because Yale is theoretically unlimited, even if the improvements are smaller than they would be in an animal sanctuary, the total positive impact is way, way bigger mm -hmm. with the, the road that we're trying to take moral ease by being that leading edge on, of, of animal welfare in the in agriculture and being an example we also create lots of content and yeah. educational content where hopefully other farms will also learn and take cues and then so it's not just our brand it's basically have to have the, the goal is to have an impact at, on agriculture as a whole yeah so scale is massive and because of that scale this is the best way to improve animal welfare and from a consumer's point of view, the best way for them to have a positive impact is to support farms like ours or any other farm that does a, an excellent job taking care of their animals and, and basically support them so that that way of farming can grow and continue and, right. and become more popular and more farmers can adopt those practices. That's how you have a positive impact on animal welfare. Yeah. I think that's so true. I, I think you really have to, you know, look, uh, look and outweigh the, the, the pros and, and the cons. You know, I think people, you know, they get fixated on their own beliefs, but they don't look at everything as a whole. They don't look at the whole situation and they don't look at, um, you know, all the different uh, things that it entails. You know, I think uh, you have a lot of animal lovers out there and, and the fact that they think, oh, the animal is going to get slaughtered, you know, that mortifies them. But then they don't think about also what happens in the wild and, you know, and and how they're they're not cared for. They're basically surviving on their own impacts, you know, and lots of things can occur. You know, most of the time they, they get eaten by larger prey, you know, or attacked by larger prey. And uh, and then also you have the illnesses and you have, you know, the different um, things that occur to animals, you know, when they're out there by themselves, they, they don't have the capability when they get ill to, to have the ability to have someone care for them and, and take care of them. So there are lots of pros and cons that people don't think about. They just think about the, the one thing that gets fixated in their head and that's it, you know, and uh, you know, a lot, of people, a lot of people love welfare and they, that love animals try to find a wild animals and try to find that as being the most humane meat that they could eat and it is great in a lot of ways as long as you have a clean kill because unfortunately if you don't have a clean kill there is a tremendous amount of suffering involved and that can happen where either the aim is off or the animal moves at the last moment like it's not a perfect system it's not managed to the same degree as humane slaughter in a slaughterhouse would be you, right. it's much more uh, consistent and reliable humane slaughter as, as opposed to hunting. But you can make the argument that farmed prey animals actually have a better life than wild prey animals. Right. Like you mentioned, uh, the fact that there's medicine. If an animal gets sick, they can get medicine, which they wouldn't in the wild. Or if they just get injured, they can get a little bit of TLC. We put ours, we have a little sick pen where we can put them where a deep pack of bedding and and lots of open space where and then we can separate them from the rest of the animals so they can just nurse their wound and improve and heal over time and we bring them water we bring them feed they don't they don't lose condition to the same way because they are they they 
they they they have all that food still available despite that they maybe that despite them not being as mobile yeah. whereas in the wild if soon we are weak or immobile in any way you're easy pickings from for for predators so right. if you're too old too slow or if you have a limp there's a, there's been there's been studies where they they can flag any animal even if it's one of the strongest animals in a herd and if they flag it or paint it or make it recognizable easily recognizable those are always the animals that get eaten first by predators because you can single them out yeah. and that's basically all so that they can focus on animals that like that are, have a limp or something like that that they move differently and doesn't it matter what the reason is, if it's a red flag or, or, or a piece of paint or a bad limp or something a swollen joint like doesn't matter what it is if it allows the predators to single out that one animal out of a whole herd mm -hmm. they become vulnerable to being so you don't have that in 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 animal agriculture yes you can we we can manage it and we can give these weak animals some TLC and nurse them back to health. So they have a second chance at life and they can thrive once again. And commercial agriculture as a whole is constantly improving. Like, uh, like I've talked before about some of the horrible conditions that some of the raw milk was produced in the beginning in these yeah. warehouses in the middle of the city where it's dark, dingy and dirty. And these animals were fed an unnatural diet where they're basically given nothing but the byproducts of the brewery industry. Yeah. And these were sickly and, and suffering. And they produced, they didn't even produce true milk anymore. And no. that basically when fertilization became really popular. Like that's one example of where the industry was at one point. But it, it it's constantly improving to the point now that it's, it's unrecognizable from where it was. And cow comfort and designing for space and welfare is is the norm it's it's in the consideration of anybody building a new barn yes so it's constantly improving and, and it, it constantly improves because those those um the best interests of the farmer and the animal are aligned yeah what's as, as the 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 animal thrives they produce better either they'll gain weight better or they'll produce more milk or more eggs basically their welfare improves their production and when, right. so that's in the best interest of the farmer and that's why it's it's just this trend of constant improvement right so but then beyond that there's also the the base level of anxiety that's very different and i don't hear any people talking about this between a wild animal and a, a domesticated animal right there's in in russia there's this study an ongoing study where they're trying to domesticate fox and they basically breed them for nothing but tameness they'll measure how tame these animals are and they'll only breed for the ones that are the most calm around people and they're trying to over generations and generations and generation and make the most tame animal and it doesn't matter what the consequences are and there's some interesting side effects to that where the, the fox will start wagging their tails, their ears will start to droop and oh, stuff really? like that. These, these changes that make them almost more look more like a dog. Yeah. That it's so like, and, um, but despite the fact of, I don't even know how many generations they've been breeding these foxes already. If you're nothing but tameness, they are still uneasy when you compare it. Like, they're still more uneasy around people compared to dogs. If you right. put them in a room and a person sits in a circle and you count how many times a fox enters the circle to kind of check out this person, this stranger, it still does not come anywhere close to a dog. The dog will, will, is still way more comfortable. And that's basically because of a level of anxiety. They're, they have a much higher level of anxiety despite being bred right. for generations to be calm. Right. So if you go back to the original fox or any wild animal that base level of anxiety is so much higher yeah. and it should be for their survival. Like if they weren't anxiety, if they weren't anxious for anything new or, or different in the, in their environment, they would have gotten yeah. eaten Not because that anxiety causes them to focus and, and be alert and always be on watch. And right. So there's that, that survivability around it. So, wild animals will have a much higher base level of anxiety than a prey animal that's on a farm. Yeah. 
like if I come into the barn, it doesn't necessarily matter what time of day, but there'll be cows passed out on their side and just sleeping without a care in the world because right. they it's bred out of them. They're, yeah. they're so they've been domesticated for so long. They don't have that fear. Right. To say they don't have fear at all would be a lie. They still have some fear. They're still a prey animal. There's still some of those based instincts. Whereas yeah. like something new happens, they're fearful, but they see me every day and it's crazy how calm they can truly be. And that's like, and when they're that calm, the beauty is that's when their different personalities start to shine because it's not just, they're all fearful and they all seem the same. They're all reacting the same. Right. It's because they're so common. So they're so used to their environment and used to us as people. You start noticing differences in personalities and they are wild differences uh, in, in, in their different personalities. You have some that are very goofy, other ones that are playful and other ones that are just really sweet and friendly. And other ones, as they get more and more calm and friendly, they almost get more aggressive. They almost get like too dominant. Oh, so really? There's, and uh, so you got to watch your back with some of these animals because they don't fear us anymore. So then, I don't know, they, they seem to treat us like a, like a herd mate. Oh, and wow. They, 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 they add you to the pecking order, so to speak. Yeah. And show their dominance. So like, you have to be careful in those circumstances, but there's all these different, this whole rainbow of different personalities arise once you have a barn full of, of calm, happy, collected animals. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's very cool. I like that. It's, it's, uh, it's funny how they all have, you know, they have their different personalities, you know, and, uh, they get, you know, they get more comfortable with you and the more they get comfortable with you, the more they kind of let it, let it shine. Uh, you know, I think, you know, when you, when you, you don't really think about that, you know, you don't, cause you, you're used to just knowing the, the standard, you know, let's say cow, you know, and you don't think that, you know, just like humans, they all have their own individualized personalities, which would make sense, you know? But it's funny how you say some are goofy and some are this and some are that, you know, I don't, you know, in my head, I'm like, wow, a cow being goofy, but it makes sense when you say it, you know, it's like, they all have their own personality, like humans. Yeah, sometimes I'm able to catch it on video, but it's like, as soon as like a stranger comes in, like they actually recognize, they don't treat us all the same. There's some animals that treat me differently than our employees and the other way around too. Like the, our employees might have some of their favorite animals and this animal will treat that employee differently than they treat me because right. yeah, that's like, so like they, they recognize differences. So if you come into a, a, a farmer's barn, these animals won't be, they won't treat you the same way they treat me. Right. And I'm able to catch some of this on video sometimes. Like when I'm, I'm walking through the barn and I'll have a cow that's just, she's in a playful mood and she'll follow me the, through the whole barn <laughs> hopping and, and jumping throwing her head around and and uh, having a good time and um and people love it when when i show that because like you see like i didn't know animals did that like a, yeah a cows did. absolutely yeah they they can be very silly <laughs> i didn't i didn't know that either but when you say it it makes sense you know but you don't you don't think about that you know because you're just, you know, you, you're, you're raised to think about cows being a certain way, you know, with their herd and da da da. But it, it's kind of funny. You should, you should start to videotape that and maybe put it online or something because that would be uh, really cool. I have, yeah. And there's like, there's other cows too. Like, like I'm, I'm a huge fan of our older, older cows. Um, but there's some old cows that I try as I might. Like, I just give them all the attention that I can. Whenever I see them, I, I stop and say hi and pet them and everything else. But like, they, they don't they couldn't care less like they, they've been through the ropes and like they know how, how their world works and like they they know what it's all about and they just they're just indifferent they, they don't care for me as much <laughs> as i care for that it's like i was like because like uh, i want this cow to be a friendly cow and like be affectionate animal like and, and i'm trying to make her calm try and make her basically because i appreciate the time that she's put into our farm yeah and um and i, I really want a barn full of just ancient cows right so but unfortunately, like this cow is just like her, her personality is just, she just doesn't care for people. <laughs> <laughs> she's just That's not mean. a socialite. She's a loner. Yeah. yeah. Or like, oh, she's playing, so, playing social with the other cows. But like with me, she's just no indifferent. And then she'll like, I'll pet her and she'll just walk off. Not in a hurry. She'll just would rather be somewhere else. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's kind of like a human. Sometimes you meet somebody, you're like, okay, you know, they're nice, but they're they're not for me. You know, it's like, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love it.
Now, if you had to like, when it comes to the listeners, like if you had to really like sum up animal welf welfare, is there certain things you'd like to stress and make people realize the listeners about animal welfare? Yeah, I feel like the, um, if you start doing some research on animal welfare, the information you find is very muddy. And there's always people with their own um with their own goals as far as creating that information or that content. And like, yeah. I'm, I'm not unbiased myself. I have my own biases. I've, I've obviously I create a living mm -hmm. with uh, using animal products. So I'm biased as well. And you need to know that. And if, will that affect the information that I put out there and it's impossible for it not to. And like everybody has biases. So you have to always ask yourself that. And, so you combine that with the fact that like the dramatic difference in commercial agriculture that's happened over the years between where it was and where it is now and where it's going like that. And that's just commercial agriculture, not, not a local farmer who, you know, or somebody myself that's trying to make a difference in animal welfare, or just the, just the industry, the industry average is, yeah. has proved so dramatically. It's almost unrecognizable. And you combine that with like, so then, so then if you look at some of this footage and you see like, un un unfortunately abuse does happen. There are bad apples. There are farmers out there that treat their animals horribly and should no longer be farmers. Like these things exist. But if you see footage out there, like ask yourself, how long ago was this footage created? What, how long was it recorded? How long ago was it recorded? So like, so like it's constantly improving. So like some old footage, a lot of stuff that you might see probably might not even happen anymore at all yeah. or happen in the, on these rare cases where you have a lot of unfortunate, unfortunate, um, unfortunate things that kind of stack on top of each other. Like, like right. personally, I believe like massive farms in of itself is not an issue. If you have a thousand cow dairies or whatever else that in of itself does not create a welfare concern these animals that live on this farm can still have an amazing life right they can still have be housed in a very ideal environment the sheer number does not decrease animal welfare because if you really think about it the bison herds of bison there were huge massive herds of bison that used to roam north america and nobody yeah. did about their welfare so it's not a matter of numbers but like it becomes a concern when you start stacking these unfortunate events, like if you have a, an owner of the farm, that's just an investor and all that they're just looking at the farm as an investment and it needs to create a return. Yeah. That's the owner. And then you start having managers on that farm that also don't work with the animals themselves. All they do is try to make sure that the farm stays profitable. And that's their own, their only incentive from the investors is make sure you're making the investors money. And right. then you start having employees on this farm that because like it's a huge farm and you, you end up doing more repetitive work. It's more factory style work. Yeah, People are interested in doing that work. It's not people that are passionate about working with animals. Not it's not impossible, but typically it might not be those people that are very passionate about working with animals. It's people that want a paycheck. Yeah. They, they just, want to go in and out and get that get their money so then those people especially like if you're in a parlor or something like that it's just like they are heavily incentivized to push these animals through as quick as possible right and they like get paid per hour and then they they want to see the, the managers want to see a certain amount of work done in that time and that's how they grade the quality of these employees right. so what happens in this when you have these stacked levels of the wrong incentives and all of a sudden you have an animal that falls yeah or gets in or a freak accident happens and the level of frustration that those base employees feel and that aren't even necessarily animal lovers they're just trying to get their paycheck like it's a recipe for abuse yeah so like unfortunately things like that can happen and like when it does they need to be reprimanded they the the industry needs to um talk about it and 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 um what do you call it not condone but the opposite of condone this behavior yeah uh, <laughs> but like basically like and then and then the industry also needs to learn from it to ha figure out how do you prevent these atrocities from happening right. so like so like all those things things that need to be kept in mind
and by the average consumer when you're doing research about animal welfare and then but like when these atrocities do happen change needs to needs to occur and yes and then like but and there's always room for improvement even on our farm when we're tr when we're actively trying to improve animal welfare i'll yeah. never get to the point where my work is done there's always room for improvement so like we gotta like check our ego yeah at the door just don't be overly sensitive when you get accusations and just constantly trying to improve and right. then and then that, that will give the consumer that opportunity to vote with their food dollars and find those local farmers or that that do care about their animals and try to find ways to improve welfare but like another, and like another thing too is like that to, to say along those lines of thinking is like those even in the u.s the vast vast majorities of farmers are family owned it's not this this recipe for disaster for, right. for welfare spoke about where you have these investors and you have these several layers of people that are only interested in profits yeah. and nothing else. Tip the typical farmer is a family owned farm. And right. and even when you have these instances where it is an investor that it's not that 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 owns the farm. It's not impossible for them to manage the farm in a way where the animal welfare is amazing. Because, like I said before, those goals are aligned. The better that the animal does, yeah, the animal is, the better they produce. And so, it's, it is in the best interest of the investors to have high welfare and have animals that have an amazing life. Right. Oh, I agree. I agree totally. And I think, you know, there is a lot of misinformation out there. And I think sometimes when negativity happens, they focus more on the negativity and then people think everyone's like that. And they don't realize that they're, that, that, you know, the agriculture has changed a lot over the course of the years and that it's, it's no longer the way people think it is and uh, that it's improved vastly, like you mentioned, you know, and I think we really need to get that out there. That's right. Yeah. yeah your, your typical food. Yeah, it has improved dramatically over the years. That's right. Definitely. And, and if you had to like, if you had to like um, to inform everybody, I just want everybody to know the different services that you provide. Um, can you tell everybody all the different things that you provide in, in, uh, on your website? I'd love to. Yeah. We produce, we specialize in animal products because we're trying to produce every way, everything that we produce, we're trying to do it in a way that will have a positive impact on animal welfare. Right. So we started with our grass fed beef and the way we try to improve welfare with our grass fed beef is we're sourcing them exclusively from the dairy industry. So, and then there's, there's a huge opportunity to improve welfare from, for, for the bull calves of the dairy industry. Like they, they either in, in the most, in the, in the worst case scenario, the the farmer can't even afford to raise those bull calves. So wow. then that like that's not very common, but it has happened and it probably still happening in some parts of the world. So that's worst case scenario for these bull calves. But then a better step above that, you have the veal industry. The veal industry is also not perfect. They 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 treat their animals well because you don't have those typical typically the veal industry is not raising their calves the way um they sometimes have been where they're fed nothing but milk and yeah. kept in really small contained areas. I feel like the 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 sentiment from the the consumer has been heard loud and clear. So typically that's not how their veal is raised anymore. Yeah. But they have a they have a shorter life. They have a life they they typically live seven to eight months. So and then and then the regular steers, the regular grain finished steers, yeah. live to be 15, 16 months old. Mm -hmm. So that's a, an improvement again. And they probably, the typical grain finished beef has spent some of its life on pasture. But what we're doing with ours is we're taking it to the extreme and we were raising them as grass fed, grass finished, which normally wouldn't even be possible in, to do it in a profitable way. But our bull calves from, our, from the dairy industry that we source for more elites, they're crossbred to beef. So they have the extra genetics to put on fat better than the typical dairy animal. So they uh -huh. actually, it is actually possible to raise them as grass fed beef. So, but because they're grass fed, grass finished, it takes longer for them to put on that layer of fat and be ready for, for the, for, for to be eaten. They typically live 24, 25, 26 months old. They, they've reached their full maturity. They're adult animals and they've had many months and 
multiple seasons on pasture. So it's a, it's, it's a positive impact on, on many levels. And then we, we also produce pasture turkeys, which actually follow in behind our grass fed beef. They, mm -hmm. they, they're three days behind. And then they, they, it kind of mimics the natural system where there would be wild birds following the, ma the massive herds of bison across yeah. North America. We're mimicking that system, and they, because like they complement each other really well, you have yeah. the, the the turkeys. They they have a hard time walking through the tall grass, so the beef eat that shorter, and then the, and then they move on, and they also leave behind um, uh, piles of manure. Okay. And then the manure attracts insects, and then there's lots of insects in general out there on pasture. So the turkeys are eating the insects, and they're also eating the fly larvae and other insects that are attracted to the manure. And in the meantime, they spread that manure out, so they're 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 spreading up the nutrients that are left behind by the by the steers. But they also add their own manure, and turkey manure is unique in that it's very high in nitrogen, which grass loves. Grass grows really well with nitrogen. So then they complement the bulls because when the bulls come back around or the steers come back around. They they have the extra growth from the nitrogen from the turkey manure, and oh, wow. it also helps me as as a farmer that on that needs to find a profitable solution to animal welfare because now I have on the same piece of land the same piece of pasture the same acreage I have the the grass fed beef and I have the pasture turkeys so it really helps with the profitability of regenerative agriculture and trying to improve animal welfare and that can make me sound like a greedy farmer but you have to remember. It is critical for there to be a sustainable solution that it has to be a profitable solution. Right, exactly. And then, and then we we use those same this this the same management style also for our, our pastured pork that are they're 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 rotationally grazed, and they're moving every single day to fresh pasture or to fresh a fresh piece of woodlot. Like they're they're moved every single day, and then because the turkeys and the pigs are monogastrics, they can't. Yeah survive on nothing but forage and grasses so they're so they have the supplemental non-gmo feed but then we also source wild seafood um we we look for ones that are, have like an msc rating on it that has that the proof of sustainability that they're not overfishing when populations are low they back yeah. off and they fish in a way that doesn't damage the environment it, they're basically managed in a way that's sustainable right so that's all of our seafood is wild and has a rating for sustainability. So we have offered, those are the products that we offer at the moment, but right. we have lots of themes and plans moving forward to, to find ways to improve welfare for all the different categories of animal protein. And like for, for chickens, there's a huge opportunity to improve welfare in chickens because they're arguably the ones that need the biggest innovation for welfare because you have the the layering laying chickens yeah unfortunately all the male layers they have no purpose so none of them live past hatching which yeah. is very unfortunate from a welfare perspective but then also the broiler side they're bred to such an extreme for for growing and putting on weight that they reach slaughter side by six weeks of age which wow. is exactly like people don't realize when you're when you're shopping and you're you pick the chicken breast that's 10 cents cheaper 10 cents cheaper than the one beside it what you're saying is i want profitability at all expense it doesn't yeah. like that's that's what you're telling the farmers to produce so like, that is the result that is the the demand that you're creating is these chicks that live to be six weeks old so there's a huge opportunity to bring back these heritage breeds, which unfortunately are not as efficient, though, but they live a longer life. Yeah. So they're, they're, because they live a longer life, they need to be fed for more days. So this food would be more expensive. But there's a real opportunity of having these dual purpose heritage breeds that live longer. Plus, because they're dual purpose, the layers, the females, you can get the eggs from. And then the males, you can still use for 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 the meat. Of the, the chicken meat so like you had that uh, there's a real opportunity there and there's also like there's also we also have really big plans for the dairy industry and i and i know the dairy industry very well because that's what i grew up on a commercial dairy farm we still produce yeah. dairy we still produce milk for the commercial market we don't offer it yet 
for moral eats because it's not yet on brand. Like our cows have an amazing life, but it's not, we, I'm not happy enough to say that this is at the leading edge of welfare. There's lots of dairy farmers that do an amazing job right. with their cows that are animal lovers like we are that do a good job. But what would be a massive step forward from a welfare perspective is if we are find a way that we can allow those dairy cows to to raise their own calf up until weaning and yeah. allow them to express their maternal behaviors. If we can find a way to do that where the calves stay healthy, which is the reason why they're typically removed, is that yeah. typically the calves not stay healthy. Right. Then then we had a very unique product that actually is a step forward for animal welfare. And then that's something that we want to offer on our, our online store, more elites, and like deliver that to people as well. Is something called like cow with calf dairy, where all the cows get to raise and mother their own calf up until weaning. And mm. it's considered impossible uh, if you if you ask anybody in the dairy industry, but we've been experimenting carefully with it for years. Yeah. And I know now beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is possible at scale. And uh, I just need to find, find uh, like I need to be able to grow the dairy to the point and then you need to grow more elites where we have the demand for our products and for support for our mission right? to make this massive investment and we can create a pen large enough for all of our cows to stay together with their calves because they need they need to be managed in a unique way and they need to be in a unique environment yeah. so the cows calves especially can thrive together so like i've i've got a long list of things that i would do in this situation mm -hmm. to make it possible based off of the experiments that i've been doing on a smaller scale yeah because we do have a fresh cow pack we have we built the barn where the cows actually have their baby calf spot where they can that's really quiet and secluded where they can stay for about 10 days to two weeks on average and then go out to the main herd a bit the, a larger group of cows mm -hmm. we have this pen that is that we would need to to keep the cows and cash together that's where we've been keeping them but because the pen is not big enough for all of our our fresh cows to stay in we we're only able to do groups of five calves at, at a time oh, and then wow. we constantly then we we're constantly comparing those to the other calves that are still managed in the typical way. And, but like, so what I would need to do is I would need to build an extension to our barn and have a big enough, quiet, secluded pen for all the fresh cows to stay for two months, which is typically at the age where you start weaning the calves. That's when they they have enough growth and then where you typically transition them into solid feeds. So okay. that's all that's all, all those other things are are in the works for more leads of like of products that we want to create and produce and bring to North America. That's amazing. And do you have any time frame? Do you think maybe next year you'll probably be in, in the U S is that what you're trying to, your goal is? Not in the U S no, the U S would be, um, that's a, uh, that'll be more in the, in the long term. And I feel like, um, first I need to grow the brand for the proteins that we are already producing the animal mm -hmm. products. And once I have that growth, then I can make that massive investment on our dairy side to create mm -hmm. the, the cow with calf dairy. Right. And that is a truly unique product. We're like, yes, the emphasis, like we're using all these products, uh, all we're using all of these different products that we create to prove, improve animal welfare. But like grass-fed meat already exists. It's yeah. just not part of the dairy industry. And like pastured turkey already exists. And 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 uh, pastured pork already exists. Like it's not a, a unique enough product for me to grow rapidly and bring it to the States. Right. Oh, there's the, there's multiple steps that need to happen first, unfortunately, before I can bring our whole brand into, into the US, which I, I, I do have the ambition to do. It is part of my hopes and dreams for moral leaves is to, to come to the States. But yeah, it's definitely, it's hard to say how, how quick, I'm able to grow the brand for more leads to the point yes. where it makes sense to make that investment into the dairy side. And then once the dust settles on that, yeah, then I can start looking farther and and um and chasing the, some of these, some of those, some of those larger ambitions that I have. So it's it's hard to give it an exact timeline because right. uh, like especially step one, which is growing the brand and being able to gain customers. There's a lot of unknowns there still. I haven't figured out the perfect formula saying like, 
now I like to, to turn this off and off switch to gaining yeah. customers or and finding that support. Like I don't have the answer yet to to do that easily. So that's like I've I've been doing like the the social media content and trying different types different types of paid advertising and reach outs and and now talking on podcasts like yours. It's 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 a it's a growing it's it's a continuous experimentation of how do I find people, how do I bring that awareness and right. create that support to bring this movement forward where we can have this massive impact on the agriculture as a whole. Yes. And I think it, it's definitely going to be coming soon down the market because it's, you know, people want healthier foods. They don't want, you know, they don't want the processed foods and people are realizing how bad processed foods are and, and, you know, and, and the difference between good meat and bad meat and, you know, that, and how some farms, you know, you know, don't put really great things in, in their meat, you know, or their processes, you know, but you do have, like you said, there's been a vast improvement. So it is, it's, uh, refreshing to know that but if people wanted to get in contact with you specifically what's your website address our website is moraleats.com m-o-r-a-l-e-a-t-s.com and there you can find our online store you can find lots of educational information about what we're doing what we're trying to accomplish and you can also find links to our social medias and uh, we also have a plot where you can sign up to our email on there and and anybody who does that lives in Ontario, where which is what we're servicing at the moment, has the opportunity to win a free sample box to try out all of our products. Oh, that's awesome. And if they want to contact you with any questions, can they is there like a contact area that they can probably contact you directly on the website? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot to mention that. Yeah. But we do have our email address on there as info at moraleats.com. And I read all those emails myself. So yeah, you, I'll probably respond to that directly myself if you have any questions or comments or anything you might want to say. That's awesome. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Sander, for coming on the show today. And, you know, and everybody remember that Sander has his own podcast show and he's on our podcast community. So if you'd like to check out his show and all his past episodes, you know, go to the um, advisor with Stacey Chalemi and his podcast will be under there with all his different episodes. So, you know, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Sandra, for coming on the show today and everything that you've been sharing, you know, in these last, you know, weeks and months have been amazing. You've, you've really educated society a lot about what goes on in react culture and, you know, the importance of, you know, taking care of the animals and the effect it has on human beings also and on our, on our health. Yeah. Thanks. It's been a, it's been a pleasure to, to have that, the, the, the stage to share this information and hopefully people listen because yeah, there is a lot of valuable information in there and lots of opportunities for change and improvements. So yeah. And, and a lot of things too, like the, the, the perspective of the commercial uh, farmer is not spoken about very often. So like there's, 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 I like to try to speak from both sides of the story, like where yeah. we're heading things that we could create as well as the, the commercial side of things, which is there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I like to clear that up while I'm at it. Right. And I think it's important to do that because I think, you know, people focus too much on the misinformation. Misinform and like you said earlier, it depends who's writing it and what their purpose is. So it's good to have people like you who actually are speaking from the heart and sharing the truth. So it, you know, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's been great. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I, I look forward to our next show together. Very welcome. I look forward to it as well. <laughs> okay. You have a great day. You bet. Bye-bye.